our next speaker is Lester Partridge from AECOM. Lester directs um, research and development in the Australian part of the company and has a career mapped out in passive and low energy building design. Would you please welcome Lester Partridge. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, this presentation really is on uh, is a case study uh, of, uh, of improving the environmental performance of an existing uh, skyscraper, and it's work that we've been carrying out in Sydney, uh, Australia, in the last uh, last uh, year or two. Um, I guess the green skyscraper concept uh, was put forward um, by Ken Yang, in fact, in uh, in his book, The Green Skyscraper, and and one of the concepts he looked at there was really. Um, developing a skyscraper which had uh, minimum energy material and water inputs um, and minimal um, non-polluting wastes and landfill outputs and, uh, and consequently a lot of the, the, the internal part of the, the, lands, uh, of the, the skyscraper uh, used re recycling and, and regeneration and such like, such as waste, um, collecting of water from, from, the, uh, from, from rain and such like, um, so that it will almost become a itself little ecosystem. And of course, um, similar to a tree, where a tree's leaves fall off onto the ground, um, they, they become mulch and then it becomes food for the tree to grow at the same time. Um, so that was the concept. What does that mean to, to buildings? Um, well, in recent years, a number of rating tools have come out and we've tried to define what, uh, what a green building actually is. And really it comes down to about eight different categories, um, being management, how you manage the building, how well it's commissioned, um, and whether you've got an environmental management plan operating in the building, how good the indoor environmental quality is within a building, um, whether it's really a nice place for people to work, and that comes from things like the visual, daylight, and also air quality. Um, and it really comes down to not just the energy consumption of a building, but more importantly, the carbon emissions of the building and the amount of energy that you burn that causes carbon emissions. Transport to a certain degree, um, what you can and can't do with regard to the location of the, the building and, and maybe whether it, it promotes uh, bicycle use and such like. Water consumption, there's a number of things that can be done there. Um, the use of the materials and wise use of materials and minimising the use. Land and ecology and of course emissions too, such as uh, ozone depleting potentials and, and, and a number of other items. Of course, there are a number of um, rating schemes around the world. The LEED is pretty well known in the USA. Uh, the BRIAM in the UK was probably one of the earlier ones. Uh, Singapore's Green Mark, HK Beam. And of course, in Australia, we use the Green Star system, which nearly all of them really look at those uh, eight different categories and then uh, put down a, a few points for innovation and then comes out with a single score. And you get either a star rating or, or a point score or such like. We also have in Australia an ABGR scheme, in fact, which, which is the Australian Building Greenhouse Rating Scheme. And it actually, uh, is, again, is a voluntary scheme, but it, you commit to your building emitting a certain amount of CO2 emissions over, the, over a year. And uh, it's, it's designed for commercial office buildings. And the nice thing about this system is that once you've committed to that, you have to stick to it. It's going to be measured at the, when you've finished your building 12, 12 months afterwards. Um, and it, uh, it holds the designers to what they promise. Of course, a lot of these green rating schemes are used for new buildings. And of course, um, there are a number of new buildings going up. And it's nice to see a lot of these new buildings are indeed um, becoming more efficient, becoming more green. There are new short green buildings, which we've been involved on. There are new tall green buildings. There are new painted green buildings. And there are just new green buildings of other different varieties. But it's interesting to remember that these new buildings are only less than 2% of the current stock. There is a huge opportunity out there to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and water consumption in the existing stock of buildings. The case study I want to look at today is the greening of an existing building in the Sydney CBD. This is a couple of pictures on the southwest and the western facade, sorry, the southwest and the southern facade. The details of the building, 
35,500 square metres. Uh, it's 30 storeys, so it's tallish in Australian standards, um, but obviously not on the world scale. It's commercial office building solely. There's a few retail sections down below and an underground car park. It was built in 1976, um, and then there was a facade refurbishment in 1996. Now, 1996 was just before um, the, the main uh, thrust of environmental buildings coming onto the, onto the scene. Uh, there were very few in, in that period, and, and it wasn't until about the year 2000 and onwards when green buildings really started to become more prevalent. The existing services with the, within the building, um, chill water refrigeration as you would for that size building, um, gas-fired heating uh, with, with gas-fired boilers on the roof, um, variable air volume air conditioning system throughout the building, uh, T8 lighting uh, throughout the system which was the technology of the day, um, and 1996 BMS technology. Um, and of course it has conventional hydraulic services throughout. There was nothing special about the building, it was a commercial office building that uh, in all its, uh, in its day, performed particularly well. The refurbishment, oh, sorry, the, uh, the brief that we had was to refurbish this building to achieve a four and a half star ABGR. Now that was the one where we had to commit to, uh, and we had to prove afterwards that it was actually going to achieve that. In order to do that, we had to aim to get a five star because there's a good chance that you're not going to have a building that's operating as you predict. It also had a, uh, a requirement to get a five star green star. Now, um, the, far, the, the, the green star requirement is um, you get six stars maximum uh, and anything up to there depending on how many credits you get from the environmental system. Uh, the ABGR of course is a zero to five stars. Now it's interesting um, from an energy point of view, um, what the first thing that we did is that we actually looked at where the energy was being used in the building. What, is, what are the main consuming items? And this is looking at the, the base building components which, which excludes the tenants lighting and power. And typically, it was pretty obvious that ventilation, cooling, and heating were the main components where if we wanted to reduce this energy consumption of this building. However, if you convert that into kilograms of CO2, it became very obvious that ventilation and cooling were actually the only items that we really needed to consider. They were the big ticket items that we needed to reduce, energy, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason for that is because gas emits a lot less carbon, uh, carbon dioxide than, than when you're burning electricity in Australia because a lot of the Australian electricity is, uses black coal. So the existing performance of the, of, the, of the building, the actual energy consumption as measured was in the order of about 574 megajoules per meter squared per annum. The actual greenhouse gas emissions were about 141 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared per annum. And the water consumption was about 52 megalitres per annum. That's what we measured. Our target to get a five star, which is what we were aiming for, was around about 70 kilograms of CO2. And where did our building sit? It sat there. So we had a long way to go to achieve a, a five star theoretical and an actual a four and a half star. Energy is uh, the orange part, uh, um, bar chart and of course the greenhouse gas is there as the green triangle. So what did we do? Well, the first thing we did was we undertook some simulation modelling. And we simulated the model as if it was an actual building, uh, and we modelled the, the air conditioning system, the lighting system, uh, the actual facade, and we, we ran it through a typical reference year of a weather file, an hourly weather data, to see what the energy was, uh, where the energy was being used, and then that allowed us to see, uh, to, to, to adjust certain components to see what impact that, that did in order to achieve that, uh, that energy rating and, and reduce that energy consumption and the greenhouse gas assumption. What that did, that actually brought the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions down to around about 95 um, to 90 to 95 uh, um, uh, kilograms of CO2, and the energy was around about 300 and, uh, 350, 360 megajoules per meter squared per annum. So we were almost there, um, but not quite. Just as a matter of interest, um, that actual versus the existing, that's the difference between how a building would operate if it was perfectly operating and how a building normally operates. And this isn't just this building, this is what we found on many buildings. When a building is commissioned and operating, it very rarely operates as well as it has been designed to. There is a huge opportunity there. And this is another reason when you design a building to a four and a half star, you actually aim for a five star. 
So we knew that this building theoretically had the opportunity to almost achieve a four and a half star. So what did we do? Well, one of the things that we did, we recommended with the existing building, we replaced the chillers, which machines had variable speed drives, higher coefficients of performance, and this was done by extending the evaporator vessels and getting better heat transfer. Actual water pumps and uh, condenser water pumps were provided with variable speed pumping um, and variable speed drives, and of course high efficiency motors, which typically shaves off about two or three percent, uh, depending on the size of the of the motors. But considering they operate quite a few hours a year, um, it provided a saving. Similarly for fans, they were also reduced, uh, provided with VSD dri uh, variable speed drives, high efficiency motors, and this had an impact on reducing the static pressure. Uh, of, of, the, uh, of the fans uh, for most of the year, ex except when they're at peak load. And of course, cooling towers, they again were fitted with high efficiency motors and variable speed drives, but we also changed the control strategy for them to operate depressed wet bulb, so that when, both, uh, when, when you needed only one cooling tower, you turned on both, you reduced the, uh, the air temperature of the water going to the chiller, and of course it operated more efi efficiently as well. And the lighting. In the amenities area, we reduced 15 to 10 watts per square meter. In the foyer areas, we replaced tungsten with compact fluorescent. And in the plant room and, uh, and car parks, we rationalized the lighting. In the open plan tenancy areas, we actually reduced the, the, the lighting from 12 to 7 watts per square meter using single tube um, T5 fluorescence. And of course, we provided an intelligent control system. The zoning of the lighting is very important. It is actually provided with um, occupancy sensors, so when people walk through the, the areas, um, then the lights would come on. If they fell asleep, then the lights would go off. It was actually a bit of a concern because people were a bit concerned that if they worked late at night, it would be dark, and uh, they didn't like the idea of it being dark except for their own areas. But, they soon, but, but, but anecdotal evidence has, has uh, demonstrated that uh, it actually demonstrates if there's somebody else in the office when the lights come on from the other side of the office. In the meeting rooms, the design, initial design, the original design was 60 watts per square meter of lighting using um, dichroic down lights and, and also fluorescence. We actually <coughs> changed the, the fluorescence to 6 watts per square meter and the down lights to 7 watts per, per square meter, giving a reduction of 13 watts per square meter on levels 13 to 28. And that's what it looked like. We also provide perimeter daylighting. Um, throughout a lot of the spaces, um, which brought us down to around about um, the 300, just above the four and a half, uh, the five star, so we still weren't there. So we were still just on the mark. We weren't safe enough. The next thing was to go to the combined heat and power, which was tri-generation. Tri-generation uses gas to burn, electri uh, to burn uh, in, a, in, a, in a generator, providing electricity, and hot water is used for absorption chilling. And that brought us down to below the five star level, and of course, it's interesting to see the energy numbers actually went up further. Other green star strategies were also used, uh, also incorporated, including a lot of the initiatives which were used in the green star. And um, of course, some of those uh, included transport, where we had bike racks and such like. Water efficient fittings, um, we increased the, uh, uh, the efficiency of those by having low flow urinals and tap wear. And of course, a black water treatment plant was also uh, proposed to go into the basement to re renew uh, to reuse a lot of that black water for cooling tower and, and uh, WC waste or toilet flushing. And that reduced the, uh, the water from um, t by about 50 kilowatt kilolitres per day, which, con uh, which, which uh, was in the order of about 12.5 millilitres per year. Also, uh, on the management side, we provided extensive model uh, monitoring so we know exactly where the energy is being used within the building. And of course, the building management system was also replaced. The savings, base building upgrades actually uh, yielded 2,500 kilograms, sorry, 2,500 tons of CO2 per annum. That's the equivalent to 561 family cars off the road and 12.6 uh, megalitres of water per annum. Uh, and that's equivalent to five Olympic swimming pools. In the tenancy, we saved 2,300 tons of CO2 per annum, which is about 537 family cars off the road. So totally, the, the project actually saved 1,162 cars worth of CO2 and about five Olympic swimming pools, providing a summary such as that. And it's interesting to see that the CO2 was reduced by around about 
98% of buildings are existing buildings, and buildings contribute to 40% of the CO2 in the world. There's a great opportunity here to, re to have a big impact on, on, uh, on the environment and CO2 emissions. Thank you.